the classes that we were taking were the standard high school classes that we would have been taking outside. We had our pick of teachers in there um, because most of the teachers were also interned. We also had, I remember my physics professor was a Pan Am uh, engineer, so they conscripted a bunch of other people who had knowledge in certain subjects that would teach those who weren't necessarily teach school teachers. The, I know that they were real short on supplies because in the minutes of the education committee I was reading that they finally got hold of some erasers for the blackboards and they would give a teacher an eraser and she'd have to sign for it so she was responsible for that eraser. <laughs> They couldn't just dole them out because everything they got was in short supply. So how did they decide who was going to go to what class where? They said everybody that had been in ninth grade come into the ninth grade classroom or something? Yeah, yeah that's pretty much. They, oh, they, so desig they designated uh, which area of these chem labs would be for what class. And if you were signed up for uh, ninth grade history, why you'd go in that specific class and they had a class schedule that they must have posted it somewhere I really don't remember exactly about what you know what the specific hours that you would have history or geometry or English but they had to have had that posted somewhere so that we knew exactly where we were going. And how did you um were you in a co-ed school before, and was it, were the classes mm -hmm. your co-ed, so tell me that. The, the school I had been attending was co-ed, and these classes were just whoever was eligible for that class, so it was still a mixture. So and uh, many of whom had been my classmates before the war. <laughs> okay, so, uh, sorry, that interrupted so, so, so who you, were you in class with, and how were, were there any budding relationships between boys and girls developing at that point? Well, they certainly did during the time that we were in the camp. It would be just like being going to a regular high school. Uh, our version of a date was certainly different, though. If you went on a date with somebody, that meant that you, in the evenings, the Japanese would permit us out in front to walk around or sit in the chairs and listen to music, and that was your date. You'd go out and walk around the out in front in the grounds where we were permitted to or sit and listen to a floor show or something that the recreation committee put on and that would be the big date. <laughs> Were there movies? We did see some movies. The, the Japanese actually brought some movies in and showed them to us and um, we even got to see a couple of newsreels that were Japanese newsreels, not ours. In fact, one of them was the sinking of the Hornet when it was sunk. And uh, we weren't too sure about that one. <laughs> now, were these news reels translated into English, or did you speak Japanese? They were regular. They had English dubbed in. If they were showing them in the Philippines, the Filipinos certainly didn't speak Japanese. They spoke English. So, were there any? Who was in the camps in terms of um, population? Were there all Americans? Were there other foreign nationals? Were there any Filipinos? Talk to me about who was in the camp. Uh, the the uh, population of the camp was everybody whom Japan considered an enemy alien. And so there was all the Britishers, Australian, Canadian, English, uh, all of the uh, Dutch were interned. There was a bunch of Norwegian sailors in with us whose ship had been caught in the harbor. Uh, there was one Egyptian in the camp. There was some Spanish, um, though I think it's because they were married to Americans uh, because Spanish per, Spaniards per se were not interned. If you had Philippine citizenship, you weren't interned. How did you find out, other than the newsreels news, were there newspapers or did you kind of keep up with what was going on? Did well, you just kind of forget it? The first two years, they let the, the Manila regular daily newspaper come into the camp. And in fact, I still have a big stack of them today that my dad had saved over the years. And then the last year when they clamped down and everything, they said no more newspapers coming into camp. Of course, that's when the tide of war was turning, so I guess they didn't want us to be. <laughs> Of course, all of this news was Japanese news, and it was slanted through, you know, their eyes. 
And we were laughing about the fact we must have had millions of submarines and everything else. The number that they sank, if you <laughs> took every article in the paper at face value. <laughs> uh, How did you personally, I mean, you were old enough to know kind of what's going on. So before Pearl Harbor, you said you maybe boycotted the department stores, but your parents were teachers. Did you hate the Japanese at certain points when, when this happened? Did you have a different feeling about these people's enemy? Because you certainly were classified as an enemy. Uh, no, I don't think we hated them before the war. I think so we were very... Sense, the Japanese. Oh. Okay, yeah. Uh, the Japanese before the war, though, even though the, their department store was boycotted, I don't think we hated them. I think we felt very uneasy about them because we'd certainly heard all the stories about the rape of Nanking. And we were very leery about the same thing happen, happening when they invaded the Philippines, that this same sort of thing would occur. So it was more that we were very uneasy about them rather than hating them. Were you scared to have the women separated from the men at that point? Was there any feeling about uh, No, because uh, we were all in the same camp, and so I don't think that we felt that anything would happen that way. Now, your father took the initiative with the schools. I mean, were there people that got into the camps and just said, oh, we're going to run our life as a daily life and started organizing? How, did, how were the camps actually? It wasn't just like free-for-all and sit around. No, it really wasn't. There had been a group of businessmen in Manila before the war who were concerned about all the rumors of possibility of war or the unease of things. And... Uh, in fact, they're the ones that had suggested Santa Tomas University to the Japanese officials when they came in as a good place to intern all the nationals, or enemy aliens, rather. And so right away, they organ organized an executive committee. It went through several different name changes over the three years that we were in there, but it started out, I think, as the... Uh, Central Committee or Executive Committee, and it was always referred to as Central Committee. But uh, they set up the camp, camp government, and then gradually it was expanded and different departments were set up, like Department of Sanitation, and they were responsible, responsible for seeing that uh, health measures were carried out and that the soap was made and distributed and this sort of thing. There were the grounds police, the GPs, who weren't real popular because they were the police <laughs> of the camp. Uh, we actually had a camp jail, which is a room, so that, and hopefully if somebody infringed on something that we knew would get us in trouble with the Japanese, the, our own people would catch it first. And meet out a sentence or put, put, imprison them or something so it wouldn't reach the Japanese in charge. Did the Japanese realize you had an internal organization? They, yeah, they were all for it. They it's worked the with our central the committee. The, yeah, the yes, the, the Japanese were very much in favor of this. It made their job easier because then when they issued orders that went through the central committee to the camp and everything that happened in the camp went back to them through the central committee. So it was very much to their advantage, too. What did your parents tell you not to do? I don't recall my parents, really. There were so many rules already in place. Rules? Because of the Japanese. So what kind of rules were rules to you that made, were, like, made you mad as a teenager, other than being there? Uh, one thing that just came up the other day that we were talking about because the early pictures show all the women and girls in dresses and skirts doing all, you know, all sorts of weird things you wouldn't expect them to be wearing dresses and skirts for, but we weren't permitted to wear shorts until, I can't even remember when that changed, but we'd been in camp quite a while. And of course by then the kids are growing, outgrowing their clothes and the, everything's getting pretty ratty. and. And they finally said, okay, you can wear shorts as long as they aren't real short. And so immediately we all switched to wearing our shorts instead of dresses that we had been before. 
physical education? Curtis talked about they formed a softball team. What about the girls? Did you do any? We formed basketball teams and soccer teams and baseball teams and everything. We all of us were quite athletic anyway, and so. And a group of us teenagers knocked ourselves out a couple of days building a basketball court. We raked and smoothed and, you know, patted it down level until we got a pretty good basketball court set of outside in the dirt. And uh, we also played uh, hockey without, you know, the proper equipment or anything. It was just... <laughs> But uh, whatever sports we could round up kids that wanted to play in. And we got several girls basketball teams going in a regular league and we'd play against each other. It wasn't through the school as such. It was just whoever wanted to did, joined in and did it. Do you remember any babies being born? Yes, there were babies born in camp. And the first couple of years, if the baby was born in the camp, the, the Japanese put the father in the jail because they didn't like this happening. Uh, they really frowned on babies being born in the camp. So it wasn't, uh, you know, and that it kind of got everybody in trouble. Was there a health clinic there, or how were the health yes, clinics? The yes. Uh, they time? set up a clinic, and then eventually when the our well, first the Navy nurses were, were brought into our camp. They were the first ones in there, and they set up the first camp hospital. And then when Los Banos, the ca other camp south of Manila, was opened because of the overcrowding in our camp, the Navy nurses volunteered to go there and set up the hospital there. Then uh, when the Army nurses came into our camp, then they went into the hospital. And by that time, uh, the nuns in Santa Catalina Convent, which is just across the road, had agreed that we could have that building as the hospital for the camp. And so that's where our camp hospital was actually located. Now, how did you get medical supplies and what kind of things did you have? And what, were there doctors among the people that they Yes, there, there were doctors among the people that were, there were, were interned. And then later, because we were short of dentists and also sort of short of doctors for the population of the camp, which by that time was several thousand, they actually transferred a dentist and two doctors over from the military camp to help fill in um, in our camp. And then, of course, we had civilians working in the hospitals who were not army. The civilian nurses also volunteered and worked there. And uh, my mother wound up that as her camp job working in the camp hospital as a nurse's aide. How did they get assigned to the different jobs? Did your committees ask or volunteer or how was it all structured? Well, they decided that everybody over the certain age, I think they started with 16 and then it was dropped down lower later, had to have a camp job. And you either found one for yourself and turned in what you were doing or they would give you one. So you... A lot of the women, there was a lot of things that needed to be done. Uh, for instance, vegetable detail was one that a lot of the women were on. The vegetables would be brought, bought at the market outside and brought in. They'd have to be cleaned. Initially, they peeled them. Later on, to heck with peeling them, you just chopped them up as they were and threw them in the pot. Uh, the rice that they brought in would have little stones, rocks, and weevils and stuff like that in it. So you'd clean the cereal and the rice. and So these were camp work details. How was the food the first few years? The first couple of years, it wasn't that bad. Okay, I was have to say the food. The first couple of years, the food wasn't that bad, right? Okay, so right. Uh, the first two years were very different from the third year because we were under uh, civilian commandants. And it wasn't, it, we hadn't been taken over by the military, whatever the Japanese officially called their military commission that oversaw the military prison camps. And so it was a lot more lenient then. They set up a package line at the front gate and people on the outside could send things in. Of course, my grandmother was out there, so she sent stuff in to us all the time. And... Uh, 
They let uh, some Japanese vendors come in and sell things, sugar and vegetables and different items in the camp. So there was this transfer back and forth between the outside and the inside. We weren't cut off, in other words, at that point. And how did anybody have any money? You come for three days and you're there for a couple of years. I mean, where did people ever even get currency at that point? Did you, do you remember if your parents ever? They ate? brought some in with them and then my grandmother would send in to them. And at that point, of course, it was all Japanese invasion currency. Mickey Mouse currency. <laughs> you could not use regular official Philippine or U.S. tender. You had to use invasion currency. That was an infraction of their major rules that they set up for the whole city, for the whole country. So there's your grandmother. I mean, at first you just know she's not allowed to come with you. And what do you, what is that? Oh, excuse me. You're taken to away somewhere and your grandmother's told she's too old and what happens from there? When we were first picked up and taken from the house and she had no idea where they were taking anybody so she was running around asking everybody she could think of to ask if they knew where they had taken the Americans and others to Europeans to register them and finally somebody directed her out to, out to Rizal Stadium. And by then it was noontime and she knew we'd be hungry and hot. And so she put together a picnic basket real fast with food and went out to Rizal Stadium. And we had already left there, so we weren't there by then. So she gave it to uh, a young woman in line that had a couple of little kids with her. And she was delighted to get it because by then her kids were starving and hot and thirsty. And then after that, it was a matter of her asking around to where they had taken them from there. And she found out we were in Santa Tomas. So as soon as, she, as they would permit people to send the stuff in, she started sending things in to us, like a mosquito net and blankets and sheets and eventually beds. <laughs> But could you, how, did you actually get to go to a fence and talk to her? Did you know she was there? Did you know she was sending it in? At, how did you know she was At first, we would go to the front okay, just so fence. Over you. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. At first? Okay. At first, uh, people would just go to the fence, and you could see through it. It was one of the ones that were concrete with the iron posts sticking up out of it, so you could see who was on the other side of it. And when you spotted somebody, why well, they'd wave and you'd wave back at them and then they'd give it to the guards and they'd pass it on in. Uh, eventually, they covered it with this woven matting so you couldn't see through. And then you went to a designated spot that was under the initial of your last name. I said L, well, that's where you'd go. And if there was any bundles or anything that anybody outside sent in for it would be there and you'd pick it up. So did your grandmother, did you ever ask your grandmother, how are you surviving? What are you doing? Did you get to talk yeah, to her? Yeah, they let us know. We didn't get to talk to her, but they let us send notes in. They would go through the Japanese censors at the gates. They had to be on a regulation size sheet of paper. It was something like four and a half by six and a half or something like that. And it would say to and from and the date at the top. And then you could write whatever you wanted to on there that the Japanese censor would pass. So you could ask for things and, and communicate back and forth that way. They also at that time were giving people passes to come in and visit. So there were some times, not very often, that she got to come into the camp to actually visit us. And then we could talk, you know, directly to her. So what was she doing? Was she just at home and then trying to get things for you? Did she stay at your house or what happened? Our house was commandeered uh, first by the Japanese Army and then the Japanese Navy. And while they were fighting back and forth over it, she'd dash in and grab whatever she could get and get it out of there. And she had to move into an apartment uh, further down the street with whatever she'd been managed to save out of our house. But I mean, how did she get an apartment? I mean, did somebody assign it to her? Did she just kind of find a place? Were there other older people she, around? No, she had to find a place uh, on her own, which as I say, it was just down the street from us. And I, I really don't know 
how she wound up with that specific apartment. Was but she along uh, with the other older people? I mean, if they were rounding up all the quote-unquote families and the older people were left, I mean, who was left that was among the um, Western populations? Uh, there were quite a few of her friends, but they didn't weren't all in the same area. They were all scattered around the city and wherever they happened to, you know, find a place to live. Or some of them managed to stay in their own homes if the Philippine, I mean, the Japanese authorities didn't want it for some reason. She did have a trouble with, problem with transportation because they'd taken our car right off the bat. And so she would have to rent a Karamata, or these are those little horse-drawn buggies of different sizes. Calaces were the little ones with two people could ride in, and Karamatas were the bigger ones you could load stuff into, and that's the way she got around. How did she and, have, uh, um, I'm kind of rubbing again, to put you on. how did your grandmother have money? I mean, how did she, after a while, where did her money come from? Uh, at first she, you know, used what we had in the bank, that which at that time, the, you could get access to her, the ones who were outside could. She used that. Later on, she would do everything from like popping popcorn and selling it to making jam and, and jellies and selling it. And of course, she sold off whatever items we didn't need and get money that way. So it was just whatever she could do to raise extra money. And... Uh, did other families that knew her too ask her to help as well? Because how many people had grandmothers that were on the outside there? Well, nobody actually asked her to help, but she would send things in for other people that she knew in the camp. And then she got, she was worrying about the American uh, military prisoners. And she happened to be on the street the day that they brought the bunch of them in over from Corregidor. And they unloaded them down south of the city and marched them through the city to Old Bilibid Prison. And she was there on the street court side and watched that. And then she decided, in her diary, she says, I decided right then and there, I just had to get in there to get supplies to them. And so the first thing she did was track down the Japanese military headquarters in the city. And she went there and argued her case and at first they said no and no and she'd go back and constantly you know badger them about it and finally they said all right you can take supplies into Bilibid. So she hastily rounded up all the food and medicine and clothing and people the minute they realized what she was doing would give her things to take in. And when she'd go buying uh, like fresh fruits and stuff in the marketplace and if the Filipino vendor discovered she was taking it to Billa, they said, oh, here, take it, you know, and take this and this and don't even pay for it. And so she'd take it to Billa bed and then she would have to turn it over at the gate to the Japanese official. And she said, but I want to know it's actually reaching them. So she said, I want a signed certificate back, you know, signed by the American officer. And uh, she's a little bitty person. And of course, white haired and elderly. And uh, so she'd get this signed receipt back from the American officer in charge saying, We received this and this and this and this. And then it gradually expanded from Bilibid to Pasai Prison Camp and Nielsen Field Prison Camp and all the ones in the Manila area. And uh, sometimes she'd get there with her load of supplies, and the guard on duty would say, No, go away. And, so she'd sit down on the curb and wait until the change of the guard, and maybe the next guard would be more amenable. So she really had to bulldoze her way through. So she spent all her time bringing you and then the That's prisoners. That's right. So, so, I mean, did she ever tell you what she was doing? How did you find out she was helping the prisoners? Uh, I think the first time we knew about that was somebody coming into camp and telling us about it who was outside and knew that that's what she'd been doing and the what she was very careful about it because she knew the things that got people in serious trouble and that would end her being able to do that and one was if anybody smuggled a note in that would that would be the total end of it and she'd get in trouble and the prisoners would get in trouble and it was bad news. 
so she was very strict about that anything she took in there was no hidden notes there was everything was open and above board did she so um, did she speak uh, Philippine no she didn't so say she didn't speak okay so so so, so what language did your grandmother speak? English okay so my grandmother spoke my grandmother spoke English and most of the Filipinos spoke speak English or did at that time the school system was all in English, so all the kids going to school knew English, and so it was pretty universally spoken, especially around the city. Uh, a few times she managed to get supplies up to Cabanatuan, which is quite a ways out of the city, but that was just a few times that they would never let her leave the city to go. She had to register as an enemy alien every year and they kept close tabs on her and at one point they quartered a Japanese officer with her in the apartment and, and she was the whole time she was very edgy about it because she knew what could happen if anything went wrong and we do know that she was picked up and taken in for questioning at least once but she would never speak of it to us and so I don't know the details of that. But. What did your parents say when they found out she was doing this other than bringing you and the neighbors food? I mean, did you discuss, do you remember talking about it in your family? Uh, I don't remember talking about it. I know they worried about her. They worried as much about her health and about her running out of money as anything else. Uh, there's nothing they could have done about it. But uh, This was your uh, father's mother? Again? My mother's mother. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit about her background again. Where was she born? When did she come to the Philippines? Uh, she was, uh, well, she was born in Iowa or Nebraska, one of those states, and had lived in Kansas, which is where my mother had grown up, and came to, and was a school teacher, and came to the Philippines with my mother in 1922, and had taught at different places all over the islands. And then she had retired when she hit 70, and Came, came to live with us at that point. And at that time, she was teaching at the Chinese school in Manila. As a, that wasn't a government school, so did, they didn't care how old she was. She was teaching English and had a few private students at the house that were Chinese students straight from China who didn't speak any English. And um, so she was always real active and real into everything. <laughs> So here she is, um, years one and two, bringing you things, and then slowly mm -hmm. putting up the wall. How did you know when things were getting bad at the camp? Uh, things got bad at the camp in, I think it was January of 44. And that was the, being, we were switched from civilian to military. They, a military commandant. That was when they had uh, barbed wire put all around the tops of the walls and sentry towers at the corners and searchlights. And they uh, put up this sawali, which is the woven bamboo matting over all the walls. And so you couldn't see in and couldn't see out. Uh, no more package line. And that's when they insisted everybody on the outside, all, no matter what reason they were out for, was brought in. And she protested strenuously. I have letters that she had written to everybody saying, no, no, I can't come in. I'm doing all of this. <laughs> but they said, no, nope, you got to come in anyway. So that's when she came in. It was for that last year when things were the worst. And that's when the Japanese said, no, the Red Cross isn't going to feed you anymore. We are the Japanese Army. So then they gave this little allotment to the shoppers and then finally they said well we'll do the shopping for you and the, that's when the food all started going downhill and they got really strict about bowing if you didn't bow correctly you got slapped around and we'd have roll calls two or three times a day and then they'd miscount so you'd stand for a roll call again and and you know just more restrictions every day but fortunately we were saying well every time they put in a new restriction we know Something in the war has gone against them and in our favor. So the worse things got, the better we knew the war was going as far as the U.S. and their allies. When did uh, things get really bad in terms of the food supplies and, and things get so that there was hardly any food to eat at all? Uh, the last few months, there was just hardly any food at all. It was, we were down to really starvation diet. 
and the camp doctor got himself in hot water with the commandant because he wrote starvation on the death certificates and they insisted he change them and he said no I'm not going to change it that's what they died from and so they threw him in the camp jail and he was still there when we were liberated so, what was the starvation diet I mean maybe it's hard for people to uh, we had well in the first place it was down to two meals a day instead of you know one where there'd be breakfast and then a very early supper you had a long stretch between supper time and breakfast in the morning and uh, lugao was what we were getting and that's a very very watery rice mush and sometimes they'd say vegetable soup and that meant that they dragged a <laughs> a vegetable top through it or something it didn't mean that there was actually vegetables in it there was no meat they no sugar uh, they started running out of salt um, trying to think of what else it just gradually tapered off till there was and what you got for your share when you'd go through the food line uh, they had these label ladles for them to ladle with, and they they gave each of the servers a scraper, and so they lay when they dipped it into the lugao or soup or whatever it was, they had to scrape the ladle off so there's nothing excess on the outside of it, and then that's what you got. And how did you? Uh, I mean, among your friends and your family, did anybody get seriously? Yeah, you could tell when people were coming, beriberi was the common thing. And you could tell when the men were coming down with beriberi, they would get real swollen ankles. And, um, and that was very prevalent. And people would gradually drag more and more and less and less energy. And even as kids, it were just, uh, I know in my diary, I found that I was writing those those last few days, oh, I don't think I'll go down and join the rest of the kids tonight. I'm too tired. I'm just going to sit up here and, you know, which is not the way I'd ever been before. And uh, so everybody was sort of dragging, and they ended school classes. Uh, when they stopped for Christmas vacation, we never went back after that because the teachers were, you know, nobody had the energy to do it anymore. So the whole camp was rapidly going downhill. And every day in January of 45, every day there'd be more deaths, like 15 one day and maybe 19 the next day, and just rapidly escalating. So how did you know when somebody was taken off to the hospital and then that they had passed away? Were there any people your age that happened here? Uh, I don't recall any of them my age dying from that, but certainly a lot of my parents' friends died. and I. My camp job was working in the hospital, too. I was a server uh, serving the patient trays. I started out working in the kitchen washing pots and pans in the camp hospital, and then I moved up to being a server, uh, patient trays. So I had to go over there whenever the hospital. And, of course, the hospital, they tried to give extra food, too. And so they were still on three meals. So three times a day, I'd go to the hospital and help serve. <laughs> What about your grandmother? My grandmother uh, was, her health was going downhill, but she was still with us. She was real sick for a while and in the camp hospital, and I don't really know what it was for. But uh, And then she was back out with us, and she was, uh, we bit, uh, they let us put in garden plots. We had garden plots that were the camp garden plots, but then they let individuals dig up garden plots at various locations, anybody who wanted to. A lot, a lot of people didn't want to bother with that, but every time they'd open up a new area and say, well, you can you know, come claim a garden plot, my parents would. And so we had fresh greens the whole time, and that's really what saved us. And so every day at lunch, and my job with the, at our shanty was preparing lunch, which just meant, you know, fixing the greens, <laughs> different with all different kinds that they grew. And there were about four or five or six uh, elderly men who ate lunch at our shanty with us who were in there with no families. And this is the way they got their greens every day. 
And after the war, some of them wrote, you know, and said, oh, that's the only thing that pulled me through was... So my grandmother was still busy doing that in the camp, <laughs> making sure everybody got their greens. <laughs> Um, what about Liberation Day? Oh, that was, I still get teary and excited when I talk about it. Um, it was about 9 o'clock at night when our camp was liberated. Of course, the bombings had started, the American bombings, the September before that, and we'd been watching the American bombers go over and bomb all around the city, and uh, they said we weren't supposed to look at them, and if you got caught, you were really in serious trouble, but of course everybody found ways to sneak peeks out the window. <laughs> and uh, during air raids you couldn't be out on the ground. You'd have to have a special reason for being out there. And we were all supposed to be in the buildings or shanties during the actual air raids. So we knew that the Americans were approaching, definitely. And then um, when they actually hit our camp, it was about 9 o'clock at night. There was no power. The power was all off. Everything was dark. Our front, the front doors were shut. The building was battened down. And the tanks came in. We could hear it rumbling and, of tanks, and we could hear shooting, but we didn't know what it was until the, ax, the first tank smashed through the front gate and came in and with their big searchlight on the front of the tank was the only light in there. And American voices are yelling at us. And uh, so everybody poured out, you know, just hysterically and swamped them. And they were trying to get their guns set up and everything because they're in, there was just 200 of them in the middle of all these thousands of Japanese military. And so they were having a hard time too, trying to get their guns set. And they had been on the march for three days. They were tired and hungry, and but it didn't seem to slow anybody down. And I don't think anybody went to bed that night. We were all just, you know, up. And I still see and correspond with the first soldier I talked to. <laughs> we're still real close friends. <laughs> and we sat on the front steps, my best friend and I, and the main building had these big steps going up and we were sitting on those steps and he gave us a chocolate bar and that's the first chocolate we tasted for I don't know how long it was wonderful <laughs> it was just a madhouse and then uh, Chase at the time he was a major colonel he became a general later who was in charge of it got in about midnight and he stood on the landing there and addressed everybody and uh, it was just bedlam but uh, a Japanese, uh, when they were, s the Abiko, who was a really intensely hated Japanese officer in the camp, walked up to the main tank, first tank, like he was going to surrender, but instead he was going to throw a grenade. And they spotted it and shot him. And uh, then all of the other guards and everybody ran into the education building, which was the big building next to the, our main building. And the upper floors were where men and boys, internees, slept. And Japanese guards had the bottom floor. So they all bolted into there. And then it was kind of a stalemate because they could shoot out at the army, but the army, our army couldn't shoot at them because they were in with internees. And so it was like a couple of days later before they worked out a compromise where they let them leave the camp escorted by American soldiers, but with all of their arms to a certain, I forget how many blocks from the camp they walked them out to. And uh, then the next day after that, the Japanese started shelling our camp. And that for a week we were under shell bombardment pretty much around the clock and a lot of people were killed and injured then who had made it through the whole rest of the internment which was really bad because that was not expected that was just totally so and did you lose any friends in that showing after the yes I did I lost a girl my age who had lived up the street from us before the war and another girl I knew real well who had been one of my classmates and and a lot of people that we knew were killed in that showing. 
when you finally, you, but your family all lived. My so family you, all survived, which was, your including my grandmother, which was unbelievable. Whole sentence, Our whole family survived amazingly, including my grandmother. And the uh, GIs had already been talking to my grandmother, the prisoners that were rescued from Cabana Tawana and places. So they were interviewing her in the camp. So I have records of these AP interviews with my grandmother that went out over what they called the Blue Network at the time. So she was already known. <laughs> finally got back to the States, where did you, do you remember what it was like when they said, yes, you're going to be put on a ship, and where did you land? Well, we didn't come out that way. We stayed over one year. So uh, we stayed in the camp until they totally closed it down, which gave people that were staying time to find places to live in Manila, because it was, Manila was just totally destroyed. It was just, in fact, it's, I've read that it was the second most destroyed city of World War II. And they finally found a house that they could rent that was out quite a ways. And we lived there for the first year. My dad, they, we stayed because my parents had been with the uh, Philippine Bureau of Education, and which was, civ Philippine, was civil service. And so they were reassigned as teachers to reopen schools and stuff like that. And so I went to the University of the Philippines my freshman year in Manila in this bombed out building that <laughs> was, but uh, it was kind of interesting living in a city that had been totally destroyed in the war. We had no water, we had a well in the side yard, and then the army set up uh, posts on different street corners with these huge big lister bags where you could get drinking water because the well was just for other purposes. And uh, uh, Filipinos would buy or not, somehow get hold of cast off army jeeps and built them into like little mini buses called jeepneys and so that was your only transportation that and walking around the city. We had no electricity, we had, I mean there just were n none of the amenities of you know living but it was really interesting. <laughs> and when did you decide to come to the Bay Did your whole family uh, no, uh, we left in the beginning of July of, ninth, of the year following the liberation, so that would have been July of 46, and the Philippines was due to receive their independence that July 4th. And so my mother and my grandmother and I left, and we came on a troop ship with, there were only 13 civilians on the troop ship, and landed in San Francisco. My dad stayed over an extra year with the War Damage Claims Commission. And we landed in San Francisco and my great aunt met us there. And of course to me this was a foreign country. <laughs> the only advantage was I spoke the language. <laughs> and where did you go to live then? We uh, spent that summer traveling around visiting relatives and that sort of thing. And then that fall my mother and I settled in Walla Walla, Washington, so I could enter a college there and pick up college. And my grandmother just kind of toured the country visiting all the XPWs that kept saying, come and visit us and stay with us. And they all called her Mother Norton. And so, she, you know, and fading her everywhere. And so she-, she got a special medal at the end, right? Coming yes. Up uh, she was awarded the Medal of Freedom through the War Department, and I think it was about 1947 when it was awarded to her. And this was through letters from the different prisoners who had been recipients of what she had brought in. Uh, one of the main ones was the uh, Army officer who was the chaplain in Bilibid Prison. He was one of the main instigators of it. And they kept trying to set up a big ceremony to award it to her, and she kept ducking out of that. And finally, months and months after a lot of correspondence back and forth and back and forth, they finally just mailed it to her. <laughs> and and how much longer did she stay with you? I mean, how much longer did she live? She lived until she was 90, and uh, she was really up in years by then. And by then she was living in San Diego, so that's where she was living when she died. And uh, still keeping in touch with all of her boys all over the country. 